Hello, everyone. I'm James Milan, and welcome to this episode of the ABCs of LGBTQ+. Um, I am joined today by a couple of experts um, who are going to guide us through the impacts and effects of COVID-19 on this particular community or, or set of communities. Um, joining me today uh, from Simmons uh, University is the Assistant Dean for Social Justice there, and his name is Gary Bailey. Gary, thanks so much for being here. Delighted to be here. And also our old friend, Valerie Overton from Lex Pride is joining us as well. Valerie, good to see you again. Good to see you. How are you guys doing, by the way? We are starting every interview, it seems, these days. <laughs> just just getting a, a couple of a couple of uh, words of, on, on how things are going for you. Um, I'm doing okay. It's uh, certainly been a change, and uh, it's been a change for a lot of people I know. I, I, feel re I feel relatively privileged that, you know, I am still able to work, um, albeit from home. Um, and so, and I'm able to, you know, pretty much quarantine at home. So I feel pr pretty privileged about uh, where I am in this in this pandemic right now. Yeah, I would say I would say ditto. I keep saying to everybody, this is not my first pandemic. Um, <laughs> having survived the uh, 1980s and 1970s, the AIDS epidemic, so this is not my first time at this type of uh experience it is my first time if one is going to compare and i've heard a lot of false equivalencies made this is the first time in this moment where people cared as much as they do they didn't care in the 70s and the 80s that people were dying um, so there's that that piece but i'm i'm privileged to be able to work to have a roof over my head um, and to uh, know that i have access to health care should i need it Certainly, uh, I, I have to say, Sorry. I I um, completely echo what you said, Gary, because having gone through those 70s, 80s, 90s with the HIV AIDS epidemic, it felt like I was losing a friend every week. Mm -hmm. um, and that was a really tough time with apparent, you know, the, the appearance of no caring or response from the government. So uh, for many of those years, so. Right, this is yeah, the government or from the government or from many sectors of the population, I'm sure. Exactly. And what you were saying, Gary, is absolutely the case. Obviously, people care now because it affects at least potentially all of us. Of course, those effects themselves are very, very different for different. Well, they are. They are. Though I would encourage everyone. There's an inter a recent piece in the Atlantic. You know, there's been a shift in this pandemic. If we look domestically. Um, to where all of a sudden it, you begin hearing people say, well, we can, we could, in order to get the economy, so here's, here's the, the, the dynamic, we need to start the economy so we're going to lose lives. But what I keep hearing is what's very interesting is whose lives are, going to be, are we going to sacrifice to start the economy? We're going to sacrifice the very lives that helped 400 years ago to undergird this economy, black lives, because the demographics are quite clear about who's affected. And um, so it's not lost on me um, to hear that it was all hands on deck. Every time you turned around, let's report. And then people began to follow the numbers. Um, I'm not a conspiratist, um, but I also am, have seen enough ethnic cleansing in the world um, to see that people take and seize opportunities. And I think we have to name things in very big ways. Um, it's. Uh, the populations that are being affected right now are older folks, so that we have generational um, saturation and warfare that's going on, and the decisions about who is going to get a ventilator. I don't know about you, but we're a little scary in terms of how we were going to determine whose life, whose lives mm -hmm. mattered. Um, and I understand the need for those kinds of protocols, um, but when you look at yourself and check yourself off and say, well, I'm in that category, I'm in this category, I'm in this category, doesn't look good for me. Should I need one of those? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that brings it up. Um, women in Massachusetts, women are disproportionately being affected by this epidemic. Unlike any other place in the country, as a public health person, we don't understand what that means yet. But it, Massachusetts is outside of, the, outside of the realm. So there's a lot here for us to really 
um, unpack and really think about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think also, you know, what we see uh, nationally is that it's really, you know, black and brown right. people and, you know, in California and Texas and places like that, the Latinx community is being desperately impacted as well as the black community and the indigenous populations, um, you know, that we probably heard in the news about the Navajo. Oh, the Navajo. The Navajo. Uh, you know, are almost being wiped out at this point. Right. And so um, it really is kind of the black and brown and and similar communities, marginalized communities that right. are being so desperately impacted. Yes. So well, let me let me yes. let me just say um, that uh, we could we could keep going on this in oh, this vein yes. <laughs> uh, easily for a while. Especially I'll just add in my own two cents, which is to say the idea of trading lives for the economy uh, is a, an upsetting notion no matter where you hear right. it from. It's particularly upsetting that it's coming from the highest echelons of our right. federal government, right. that, that notion, um, and from a number of state houses as well. Um, but we are here, in fact, to focus on a, a few of the vulnerable populations mm -hmm. that are out there and to whom, who are being disproportionately uh, impacted um, by COVID-19. So um, whether we want to talk, and, and I'm going to let you guys basically I'll throw some things out here that we want to talk about, and then I'm going to let you guys kind of figure out who's going to take, uh, to take you know, each, each question on or, or do so in, uh, in partnership. Um, but the kinds of things that we want to talk about, the impacts are clearly broad. They're social, right. their health, their employment, they're legal. Um, all, all of those kinds of kinds of impacts. And then, of course, we're talking about an LGBTQ plus community that is extremely diverse in, in its identities, its orientations, its ethnic and racial makeup, et cetera. So that's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, let's start by looking, um, because this began and still is primarily a public health crisis, Let's look at health first, if that's okay. Um, and um, I know Gary, of course, all, this, all the students would have been sent home um, a long, long time ago at this point mm -hmm. um, from, from Simmons and, and the other colleges and universities in the area. The population that we're talking about here, how have they been impacted by the fact, for instance, that health requires that they now be home and therefore isolated? Um, how is that affecting the population of students that you generally deal with? Well, clearly our, for our undergraduates, and I, I interact predominantly with our graduate students, so I'm de dealing with an adult population, but let's really think about what happens when you're going through your own coming out journey. So that for many people that, you know, you're an 18 year old uh, young woman or person, individual, who comes to university and then begins to understand that you like people of your same your same gender, um, and that's who you're attracted to, and you haven't come out yet. You haven't come out to your friends, you haven't come out to your family, you haven't come out to anybody. And you're trying to negotiate, um, you know that spring break, because that's when we ended, we extended spring break, so the first week of March, so that you're getting through that period, knowing that you can come back and trying to figure out, if you're like I was, how do I get to stay in Boston with the person now that I'm involved with so I don't have to go home, or how am I gonna be my authentic self? And then next thing you know, you're not coming back. You're now in this space where you have to negotiate um, these new parameters and terrains. Um, and it gets very complicated. And so that we have continued to provide the kinds of social supports, the social emotional supports through our counseling centers to students who, uh, who need that support. Thank God for telehealth um, and telemental health as a way of helping people to stay connected. Um, but it does put you into a, um, a kind of a hotbed of angst that you would otherwise have some distance from. And that taking that away um, really um, heightens uh, some of the, the anxiety, the, um, you know, in social isolation, let me say this about social isolation. You can be surrounded by people and still be socially isolated if you can't be your authentic self. 
so that if you're withholding your truths from people around you, you're, you're ultimately very, very isolated in the worst way, which is why we see such a high suicide rate amongst adolescents as they're doing their coming out journeys, because they feel extremely isolated, yet they're surrounded by people. Yeah, and you know, your response reminds me that, of course, there's, there are physical health aspects, Right. That's what's driving all of this in a lot of ways is concern about the virus and contracting it and, and contracting it and what can happen. Um, but then, of course, there are infinite number of mental health repercussions right. for what's going on right now within the communities that you guys um, you know, know so well within the LGBTQ plus community. Um, do you see that there being much of a, um, a any difference in the health physical health concerns? of folks in that community versus the mental health concerns where it's clear there's going to be, you know, a, a, an outsized impact. Yeah, I think that we um, certainly, you know, in talking with high school and college students, I'm hearing on a daily basis, like the mental health impacts. Um, there's a lot of anxiety and depression and, and suicidality going on because so many are living in unaffirming circumstances right. without kind of the outlets that they normally have. On the physical health side, you know, it, it's a complex arena because um, on the one hand, you have members of the LGBT community who have underlying conditions that make them more vulnerable to COVID-19. On the other hand, you also have a lot of members of the LGBTQ plus community who um, don't have easy access to appropriate health care. So if you're transgender, for example, um, if you contract COVID-19, uh, you are unlikely to find yourself in a clinical setting that is going to be affirming of your um, identity. And so what we see is um, lack of access to appropriate health care given kind of uh, someone's identity um, and also a reluctance to seek health care for those very reasons. Right. So it's, it's pretty challenging. One of the yeah, risks, uh, yeah, one of the risks for particularly for the members of the trans, trans community is having access to affirming health care. Uh, options yeah. and I can't tell you how many of my trans friends will talk about not being seen by healthcare providers because of the fear of being uh, poorly treated or uh, uh, dead named or mispronounced or all of all of those things that occur. That, you know, there's not a Fenway Health in every city and small hamlet in town. Uh, and people here in the Commonwealth come from all over New England to go to Fenway um, because of its reputation. Those don't exist um, across the country. Uh, and so getting that kind of access, I'm trying to stay on hormone treatments, trying to have access to your, so if you're on uh, any kind of hormone therapies or interventions, it's one thing to go to a CVS where no one really knows who you are. It's another thing if you're in a small town where everybody knows who you are, how are you gonna get that script filled? What do you need that for if you're on prep? Uh, why are you taking this? I've known you and your family for 100 years. What are you doing, Johnny? Why do you need this medication? For what reason? Um, mm -hmm. Or you need to have your, an adolescent or a college student who's HIV positive, which there are numbers of, who need to have their meds filled and no one in their town or community knows, but you're all of a sudden your pharmacist who knows your parents. And HIPAA, HIPAA's there but you still know that someone knows something um, that, that you, you don't know, want anybody else yeah. to know. Yeah, I appreciate the fact that you guys are, 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 are starting to put us into uh, the mindset to share, to, 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 to empathize with what kinds of thoughts are going through people's heads because I suspect that there are uh, plenty of people out there who would think, hey, you're talking about um, your health, and life or death if you go and seek treatment versus oh they might not use your right pronoun etc and people aren't going to understand that 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 can be a real inhibitor so i'm glad again and and invite you to you know continue to flesh out for us 
just what, what kinds of internal conversations are going to be going on that would stop people um, from actually accessing health care, even, uh, even if it's possible, even if they have uh, options of that sort. Let, let me say what I often say in settings uh, around the country about this. Shame is probably one of the most powerful forces that any of us have ever experienced. And everybody knows a moment when they have, because of shame, not done something that they know was in their best interest, but because of the fear of being shamed, of being embarrassed, of being called out, of being othered, of being made less than, we are pack people. You know, one of the interesting things about human nature is we need to be part of the pack. Um, it, you know, it's, it in many ways is deviant to be the one outside leadership. I always tell my students, leadership by definition is deviant because it means you're outside of the, that pack, that safety space. Um, and so when we think about the power of shame, I have watched people on their deathbeds, literally standing by their deathbeds, who won't acknowledge what they're dying of because they don't want to be embarrassed. They exit this world, they have exited this world, telling me stories that we both know not to be true, but as long as they don't say it, therefore they die with a reputation intact. I've seen it, I've seen it countless, countless times. Uh, you can see someone do something and they'll tell you they didn't do it because the shame is too great to bear. Um, yeah, shame okay. becomes such a powerful, powerful anchor in so many people's lives. Um, you know, that's why recovery, if we think about recovery, part of the recovery model is letting go of the shame of having an addiction, of having a problem, of having a challenge. Until you can let go of that, you can't begin to recover because you'll do everything to mask it. And so the shame of being called out, of being denied, of being mistreated, um, that is a, that's a universal. Most people get it. They just then have to be able to take that from an intellectual to an empathetic point of view. Right. Um, and I, I think when you also, like, you know, for a lot of transgender people and even you know, LGB people as well, a lot of people have pretty unpleasant experiences with um, the healthcare system. Right. Um, and so then when you think about going into a clinical setting where you don't have a previous connection, where you don't have a level of trust, um, and you aren't sure that they are going to respect your need for uh, hormones or prep or whatever the case may be uh, you it becomes frightening at that life and death level right. about right. whether you're going to receive the other care that you need right. in addition to the COVID-19 care mm -hmm. really excellent points um, you know I'm, I'm mindful of the fact that we are going to be talking again about a number of different areas of impact and then a number of different portions of the population um, as we go through these areas, I think uh, it will be important to balance what is a lot of grim uh, acknowledgement of reality um, uh, with resources, ideas, et cetera. So in the health area, for instance, mental and or physical, uh, what are, uh, you know, what can be done? Where, where can people go? Um, uh, what are resources that can be useful um, that we should share? Oh, well, clearly, um, Boston Medical Center um, is great, Tufts, uh, Tufts New England Health, uh, uh, Tufts Health Hospital, um, Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where I get my care at the Brigham, where I've consulted and helped people to really think about how can they be more embracing of trans patients. The hospitals are doing, you know, and particularly the practices within the hospital, Children's Hospital for um, their GEMS unit is one of the best in the country, if not in one of the best in the world. We have great resources. What we've learned through this epidemic is the falsehood of what it meant to be some of the best in the country, is that our <laughs> system still failed. Our systems are the best when they weren't taxed and in crisis. It's very easy to be the best. Now we are looking at we're not the best. Mass General failed. I mean, our systems failed. Um, and so, and they failed everyone. They just didn't fail queer people. They failed everyone. Um, and I think that that's been a wake up call to the systems. Uh, the mental health system, 
Um, I think that we have a lot of work that we need to, to do. There's a lot of, of um, uh, health, community-based mental health centers, private practices. There's a lot out there. The National Association of Social Workers has a referral system, American Psychological Association, American Psychiatric Association. Social workers are the largest providers of mental health services in the United States. So that's where you go to get your care. Um, primarily, so that there's no question that they're providers. Our systems were taxed before this. There were waiting lists before this. And the more intersectional a therapist you needed, the longer the wait was. So Fenway is great, but if you needed a queer therapist of color, you were going to wait because there aren't that many. Mm -hmm. There's right. so few as to be embarrassing. So that there is a need for us, we are going to get slammed um, I'm not a denier of reality because you can't fix anything. You know, what did James Baldwin says? Everything, not everything can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. So that we have to name the complexities. The complexities are our systems were, the mental health systems were underwater. This is the opportunity now for us to become much more creative. And it's a frontline issue that we need to be able to create that kind of training that needs to happen um, to get that next generation workforce up and running. Um, but I think, I think we're, we're going to be there and I think we have the right systems in place to, to begin to respond to this. Um, right, at that systemic level, like we, you, you, we need so much more as Gary right. was saying. Um, I think for people who are looking for um, like support groups and peer groups and things like that. You know, there, the Fen Fenway Health has a number of support groups and, and peer groups. Uh, Bagley uh, for youth, for teens and young adults. Uh, Boston Glass for teens and young adults of color. Um, and uh, the AIDS Action Committee. Clearly. AIDS Action Committee. Youth on fire. Uh, you know, all of all of these have uh, support groups and peer groups, and that are running virtually uh, that people can join um, on a very informal basis, just right. on an as needed basis. Um, and also uh, Lex Pride here in Lexington, we serve you know, the greater uh, area as well, not just Lexington. So there, there are those resources as well for people who need something right now. Yeah, those, are, those organizations are, I bet, like other folks we've talked to actually, you know, running uh at at, at compa you know running on on all <laughs> cylinders at the moment because it's it's remarkable just how much uh how how busy people can be in this socially and physically isolated situation of ours right. because of the services that need providing let me I, ask I, you guys one I, more i just want to before we yeah. move i just wanted to add one other thing or two other things there's also lgbt uh flashback sunday there's a group for lgbt elders of color um, mm -hmm. that uh, is part uh, affiliated with, it's now a separate entity with Fenway Health and uh, their LGBT aging project um, is another great resource um, that continues to do work um, in, the, in the community. And so those are just important resources because we often forget about older LGBT folks. We kind of go off the radar um, at times. Let's, let's talk um, about the, um, the economic um, impacts and employment impact here. Again, uh, we've already acknowledged and, you know, bears uh, briefly repeating that uh, all of us are dealing with, uh, you know, uh, a whole confluence of, uh, of effects of COVID-19. Um, and of course, the LGBTQ plus community is dealing with those same effects. Um, what are particular, though, in terms of economic and employment effects here uh, that, that, that uh, are impacting this community? Well, you know, one of the things as I look at my own, I'm lucky to have friends who are at different parts of the spectrum. We have friends who are just so economically secure that this just is not going, they're looking at the market. The market is what's determining how they're going to be, and, and they've, got more be nice. than enough, they've got more than enough cushion. Um, but then I think about those people for every restaurant that closes, 
I think about all of the barbacks, the bartenders, the waiters, uh, the wait staff, others uh, who um, don't, have their, don't have their income. I think about every hairstylist, every beauty salon, not to be stereotypic, but we are, in terms of talking about queer spaces and queer places of employment, um, you know, we are in those salons, we are in the galleries, we are in the, the places where people are, are decorating, we are in those places where um, people are doing uh, gardens. We are, we're doing a lot of those things that are hard hit industries right now. And so people are not necessarily working. I look at all of my friends who are real estate, you know, big players in real estate. Well, they, it, will bounce, it will bounce back, but the market is not moving right now. Um, and so those industries, as we begin retail, just really think about retail in general, for across a whole continuum, you know, where do queer youth, where does trans youth go to get a job? Well, they can get a job at J. Crew. They can get a job for possibly at, uh, because some of those industries depend upon if you're a black and brown trans person, you aren't gonna get jobs in some of those places because of the profile of who they wanted to hire. Um, but those were places where you could get that job. Um, if you walk into, you know, I say to everybody, walk into your local grocery store and see who's standing at the cash register, who's essential. They're young people, they're brown people, they're black people, because that's who people are hiring to do those kinds of jobs. Those are also, when you look at the black and brown, you can't immediately see, you don't know that they're not queer. You don't know that they are queer. So that there are a lot of intersectional pieces that are happening there. And you also see lots of older folks doing those jobs as well those yeah. are the continuums mm -hmm. and yeah i i agree completely and i i would just add too that there we're starting out with disparities in right. employment right. so lgbtq people and especially trans people have are starting out uh with lower employment rates or higher unemployment rates than the general population to begin with so we're starting out at a lower economic level for many of our populations, not all. Right. And then those who do have employment um, are disproportionately in these industries, as Gary said, that are hard, um, you know, that have been impacted most severely. So the, we see a lot of disproportionate economic impacts in the LGBT com community. Yeah, I'm struck by the fact in what both of you have said, uh, about the intersectionality that you were mm. mentioning, by which Absolutely. I mean the overlap between what you were just saying, Gary, about you know queer and trans, the the opportunities for queer youth, for trans youth, etc. Where are they going to be? And then also what you were saying about you know folks working in these essential industries, the, in terms of grocery store type essential industries. Um, it, there's such an overlap between what I know about what's happening with brown and black populations. And again, disproportionately within these uh, particularly vulnerable uh, industries, et cetera. Um, but also, you know, on the front lines right. in a sense, not by choice, no. I'm sure. No. No. Um, and so just talk a little bit more about that. Well, when, you, when you're part of, you know, when you're a young person, the privilege of being a young person with a job is to be able to take the money and put it in your pocket so that you can go out and buy another pair of Air Jordans, um, which I've never owned, so I don't know how much they are, but I think they're expensive. Um, so that that's, that's one level of privilege, so that your money is your mad money. I had that kind of privilege when I was a kid, you know. I was lucky enough to have parents who gave me an allowance for doing work around the house, so that. But when your money that you you have to bring in helps to contribute to the love to the livelihood of the entire household, it isn't that you're doing something for yourself. You're part of what's helping this whole household, and you may be the only person right now with a job, or you're the only person that you're the one that's working because everybody else in your family might have been working under the table, depending upon your status. Um, so and that they're not able to get the, because they don't have a social security number, that your family members aren't able to get that small amount of money uh, from the government that really doesn't pay for much of anything. Mm -hmm. um, so it, the importance then of being able to have work means that you take on more risk that you might not otherwise want to risk. So you're gonna work more shifts, which we know is probably 
the, expo the risk of exposure goes up the more you're in spaces where the virus is there. So you're at greater risk to being exposed because you're there too long. And so you're working as many shifts. So you're working seven days a week um, to be able to make ends meet. It's going to increase your risk. Um, you add to that um, the other risk to all of to COVID, particularly looking through a youth lens, is the belief, and every teenager has it, of they're being infallible. It's not going to happen to me. This isn't going to happen to me. This is something that's going to happen to you. Therefore. I don't know how many times I go into the grocery store and say to young people, why is your mask not up on your face? It's not a neck band. <laughs> you know, it's not helping you around your neck. You need to have it up on your face. Oh, well, I know these, you, that's not how this works. That's not a logical <laughs> statement. And, but that's how their brains work, you know? And, and that's any young person. So trying to speak into safety into an adolescent brain and then you add into that all the other kinds of intersectional pieces of what does it mean to be um, queer or different? What does it mean to take risks sexually at this point? Not understanding, you're at a point where your hormones are telling you to do things that, it, that you're, you're, you know, my brain is telling me, no, I'm not gonna do that because it's too risky. My 18 year old brain probably was not gonna think about certain things in the same way. And so the exposure of doing something that you should do as part of your growth process now can be risky because we're not even talking about safe sex in the age of COVID. I've not heard a discussion about that, about how do you have sex? If anyone else has, please let me know about how do you have sex with this virus? I can tell you what you do around the AIDS virus, HIV, but no one has told me what you do with COVID mm -hmm. at a time when young people should be sexually experimenting. And right. then we're not talking about, I want to name another population when we talk about jobs because it's just the shadow industry. We're not talking about sex workers. Yeah. Sex workers are still having to work. Mm -hmm. There are still Johns out there who are looking for sex workers. And, you know, and what does that mean in terms of the risk and the exposure? Um, and that whole industry, um, the Johns who participate are very secretive. Um, they are risking, they've been willing to risk lots of different things to take back to home. Um, and so this, this is a whole other, much more complex discussion that one needs to have. And that very often those sex workers are young queer people and very often trans women of color. Yeah, and uh, uh, as you're speaking, I'm realizing also that uh, you're talking a lot about the impact on young people, and I'm glad you're doing so because I was thinking, oh, well, at least there's been this expansion of, of unemployment that I know has been, you know, has helped a number of folks in the restaurant and other kinds of service industries that I know of. Um, it, is, it has improved their circumstances. Of course, young people can't even draw unemployment. No, they can't draw. They can't draw. Right. And, and many immigrant communities. Right. Right. sex worker communities, you know, there are many communities that are disproportionately queer that um, that cannot draw on those. Right, right. I mean, I'm always, I remind, I say to my students to think about all of the names. Every September 11th, we read names, we call names, and we, you know, I have a friend who, uh, a queer friend of mine who died on one of the planes. I watched the plane go into the tower, did not knowing he was on the plane. Um, and so I, I get that piece, but I always think about all the names who we will never know, who are the undocumented people who are working in the kitchens in the building, whose families can never have those names read because they can never say that they were there because by acknowledging that they were there, they expose themselves. Um, so that we know that without a social security number, you cannot access any of these benefits. Um, and what does that do to families, and particularly if you're DACA, um, and you're, you, and so you don't want to expose your, your families. Um, so I think that we really have to think about, uh, this is a very, very intersectional um, piece. Uh, uh, Larry Kessler said many, many years ago, and I had the honor of working with Larry when I was chair of the AIDS Action Committee board early on. Um, and he talked about the, how smart viruses are. And I'll never forget this. He said the AIDS virus is a very smart virus. Viruses adapt. They figure out where they need to be and how to be there so that you really have to be smarter than they are because they're looking for opportunity. And he says that with, and he talked about the HIV virus. The HIV virus found all the cracks 
and fissures in our society and it filled them in. It filled in all of those places um, that we were vulnerable. So any of the spaces, racism, sexism, heterosexism, homophobia, that's where it went. COVID is doing the same thing. It's the same smart virus. Um, and it is filling in those cracks. Um, and the vulnerability of youth, if we look, I'm a member of the LGBT Youth Commission, and one of the things that was real clear when we look at LGBT youth is all of the risk factors, the, the degree of trauma that exists in the, pop, in the youth population. Um, I just saw a piece from the National Association of Mental Illness that basically said there are going to be more people in the United States with PTSD-like symptoms. This was before COVID than who ever saw combat. So these were non-combat related individuals from violence and living in our, in our cities and this country who were developing, uh, who had trauma and PTSD. That's alarming. Now that was pre-COVID. That's data pre-COVID. Yeah. So um, we, have we have large conversations about the inequities that have been um, exacerbated through COVID about the ways in which, again, as you were just saying, this virus has crept into all these existing gaps in our society and made them worse uh, in many ways. Um, there are smaller conversations that we're also having about, is there an opportunity here? Mm -hmm. Is there something that we can learn and move forward with, et cetera? I'd like to, to ask you to focus on, on that mm -hmm. part of things uh, for a couple of minutes and, mm -hmm. and tell us, you know, are there things that we can or should or have been learning uh, through these, you know, through, through this emergency extraordinary time um, that we can bring forward in mm -hmm. a way that holds promise? Yeah, I, I, the silence. No, 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 no. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting that I'm I'm a I'm a perpetual optimist. I always think that things can be better, um, but I'm also a harsh realist that says nothing can get better if you don't look at what's not working. Um, that you can't make it better on a hope and a dream. You have to make it better based on data and facts. And the data and facts are that this new normal that we are having the opportunity to build, and I've been saying this in terms of we're coming out of a, a we're in the midst of an, a new gilded age where the rich are so rich and the poor are so poor. You know, we've lived through these periods before. Out of that gilded age came the progressive era. That progressive era created more reforms and created the, side, the society that most of us grew up understanding how you work, where you live, quality of life, air, access to space, et cetera. And I think that we'll come out of this similarly. I think that we're going to come out of this gilded age with a new progressive era, that this period, and I just thought this the other day, has been a wake up call. We have gone from the helicoptering parents to what I've heard referred to as the curling parents, you know that sport curling, where people run in front of this brick, getting it's every just, little piece of dirt out in front right of behind, so that it goes. Well, we really want to think about that. The helicopter parents created the curling parents. The curling parents who wanted nothing, their kids to never experience anything bad. That's now off the rail. It's a new generational moment, and no parent could fix this. There was no magic because parents couldn't figure out what to do for themselves. So here's a wonderful opportunity for a couple of things. Kids didn't discom discombobulate. They're, they're stronger than we gave them credit for being. They're actually more creative because if it wasn't for them and the vision, some of the exciting stuff that's gonna come out of this, <coughs> technology can be useful. Uh, who got it? It's beyond social media. What we're doing right now could not have happened 10 years ago. Um, so this ability to use technology to reach people, that's a young person's game. They're gonna take this to such a place that is gonna be so exciting. And you're still gonna have TikTok. You're still gonna have this and that. I, I think that's really super exciting. And I also think that it means that we now see something in, the re in real time. I have more people now who have been awakened who no longer deny that things weren't working. Mm -hmm their ability to stay in that space, there's a dissonance. They don't know what to do with it, 
but they can't go back to pretending now that they haven't seen what they've seen. They just can't. Mm -hmm. And so they're in a space now of trying to figure out, okay, how can I be part of making it better, but I can't pretend that I haven't watched what I've watched and seen or heard about or looked at. And I think in that comes the opportunity to create those new systems, to train people in different ways, to what a perfect time to look at um, you know, uh, Boston is hiring 40 new social workers in Boston public schools. They're needed now more than ever. When kids get back to school, there's going to be a frontline workforce. That's a positive who have, are trained in different models than people who've been doing this work for 20 and 30 years. They're coming out with a better understanding of today's kid than some of the people who, like myself, who train in a very different model. So I think that's exciting. Um, I think that we are uh, it, the positive about this is that you could be involved with COVID and be queer and not be minimized in the same way that it's still a virus. People talk about the virus and the shame that goes with the virus, but there's a different thing that society doesn't see you and say that you're a bad person, unless you're at this point Asian. Now, Asian, that's a different discussion that we're having. Right. Right. Very different discussion. Um, and so I think that that's a positive that we can reframe. Um, these pieces because we built the infrastructure. If we hadn't had AIDS and HIV, we wouldn't have helped move people in some ways to where doctors and nurses were putting photos on their gowns so that you, if you were going to be in a hazmat suit, that they wanted you to know that they were a human being. That didn't happen 30 they years like ago. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So I see that the positives. Was... I think that we will come out of this in a very exciting, innovative um, way. Um, I don't want and will fight with every ounce in me to go back to where we were. Because I do think when people, some people talk about the new normal, they want to go back to the old bullshit. Yes, well, as you said about James Baldwin, you know, now people can't unface no. this reality, no. as you just said. But anyway, Valerie, I wanted to ask you. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think that, you know, Gary said it, you know, beautifully, kind of spot on in terms of kind of where kind of the excitement is and what the possibilities are for the future. Um, I, I'm also just struck by kind of what's happening right now when we are needing to connect virtually rather than in person. Um, what we are seeing in some instances is actually greater access. So for example, um, when we run kind of some of our kind of virtual activities, Lex Pride runs kind of a variety of virtual activities to help people connect as does other organizations. Um, and even like the, the Pride Prom for teens, um, which was virtual. So people who didn't have access to the transportation needed to get to places um, in person, uh, many have access to uh, the internet and are able to connect with these activities virtually. Right. Not everybody, because not everybody has computers and internet and, you know, all of all of that stuff, but um, that, you know, there are these kind of pockets where we are actually able to expand um, access uh, compared to having everything in person. Right. So, you know, and also, you know, we, you know, we see a lot of innovation in terms of like Lux Pride has a library of books. Well, people can't just go to the library anymore, but we have our listings online and we have contactless exchanges of books and so forth. So uh, uh, queer themed books. Right. So, you know, there are these, you know, kind of snippets of what Gary's talking about in terms of like reimagining things for the future. You just see like, the little beginnings of that, little snippets of that now. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we we could go on um, <laughs> for a long, long time, really. We definitely have not gotten to everything we, we were hoping to, but our time is running out. I wanted to ask you um, both um, as a kind of concluding question, and with the acknowledgement that this is not an easy thing, but because you'll be asking uh, or you'll be thinking on your feet, but if we had the old magic wand here um, and each of you got to pick one thing that you could 
change either on a systemic level or much more locally or personally or something like that right away, um, what would it be? My magic wand, it would go back to Dickens. It would be, if you look at a, a, a Christmas carol, when the final ghost comes out and lifts up the, his gown and the two children under the gown are want and ignorance, I would eradicate want and ignorance. Yeah, well, um, I think that probably covers it because I, I was thinking of like, you know, raising the magic wand and um, and eliminating, you know, racism and homophobia and transphobia. Um, but I think what Gary said kind of, you know, if you <laughs> erase wand to ignorance, you're going to kind of cover a lot of That's right, else. those and, and many other. <laughs> I yeah. actually like Gary's better than mine. <laughs> well, they're Dick, turns out, Dick, turns Dickens, out Dickens, Dickens right, 180 <laughs> years ago, 150 right. years ago, Dickens had figured it all out, right? He really yeah. <laughs> Well, I want to thank you both, really, for joining us thank um, you. very much. And it has been, you know, I often say this, um, and I, I never, and I, I never don't mean it. Um, but I want to say again, um, I learned stuff um, listening to you. You, you, both of you were able again to take populations that you know very well, and to put us as viewers, as people interested but ignorant, put us into their into play into those places, so that we have a better understanding of what it is that people are dealing with. Uh, even if we don't know those people ourselves. Um, so I, I appreciate it very much. I'm sure our audience will as well. Um, this has been uh, an episode of the ABCs of LGBTQ+, plus, uh, looking at the uh, many impacts of COVID-19 on the various populations that make up that community. Um, I've been joined by Gary Bailey from Simmons University and by Valerie Overton from LexPride. Again, thank you both for, for being here and thank you audience for joining us. We'll see you next time. I'm James Milan. Mm -hmm.